Hi friends, this is John. Welcome back to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, where we talk about all kinds of fun stuff related to agronomic sciences and human health and cultural management practices that can regenerate our ecosystems that we're a part of. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. My guest today is Austin Unruh, who is perhaps of the various people I know of, he's on the forefront of uh, innovating and leading and thinking about opportunities for silvopasture that can be developed in the future and that uh, and is actively doing this work in the space now. So Austin, thank you for joining me here. I've really been looking forward to this discussion. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, your journey and your pathway and the work that you're doing today and what got you here? Absolutely. Thank you, John, for having me. Well, so I'll, I'll introduce myself a little bit uh, and, and the, the company that I run. So Austin Unruh and I run Trees for Grazers. And as the name of the company suggests, uh, our focus is indeed on integrating silvopasture, integrating trees into pastures. And it's been a very circuitous route in order to get here. Uh, by no means did I intend to get here. Maybe 10 years ago, if you told me at 10 years ago that I was going to be leading a silvopasture focused company, I probably would have asked you what silvopasture was. Um, so I did not grow up on a farm. My dad grew up on a farm, a Jersey dairy in Minnesota, but I myself did not grow up on a farm. But came out of college wanting to get my uh, hands in the ground and wanting to do something where I had a lasting impact in the natural world. And I wanted to have something involved with agriculture. I had read the book Restoration Agriculture by Mark Shepard, and that inspired me to the vision of uh, landscape scale agroforestry and wanting to see agriculture that was both economically and also ecologically viable, sustaining, and led to to thriving both ecologically and economically. So that was kind of my my guiding star, as it were. And I started out uh, with a company, well, a company, it was just me. <laughs> it was just me doing work on riparian buffers. I'm located in southeastern Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Uh, for better or worse, we send the most pollution down to the Chesapeake Bay. So there's a lot of water quality related funding available for Lancaster County to do uh, stream related uh, water quality related cleanup. So that was my my entry into agroforestry was through riparian buffers from a conservation perspective. And once I got into that, I had a number of clients who were also grazers. They were dairy grazers. And I was working with them to get trees established along their streams. And they said, this is great, but how do we get trees established in a pasture? Because I have cattle out on pasture, they're grazing all day long, and they need access to shade. And I had done some studies in agroforestry at that point and knew that there weren't very many tried and true methods of getting trees established at any kind of scale. And for, for a budget that works for a farmer, you can, you can get trees established if you fence out a big area and plant a big tree, um, but most farmers don't have the kind of money to do that at a large scale, right? So we just started experimenting. Uh, we started playing around with different methods of protecting trees and integrating them into pasture in a way that was minimally intrusive to the way that the farm operates, right? We don't want to have to completely take the take the land out of production in order to get those trees established. We don't have want to have to change the way that the farm is is managed or operated in order to get those trees established. We're also, uh, given that we're in Lancaster County, land goes for anywhere from thirty to fifty thousand dollars an acre or more. So it does not pay in this area to take land out of production for five years, 10 years until the trees are large enough to get the cattle in there. So that was our our start in the silvopasture world. And over the last number of years, we've just refined our techniques for getting trees established and have also uh, worked on other things like starting to improve the genetics, the tree genetics that we're working on and finding more more funding for farmers so that they can reduce the cost of investing in trees for a silvopasture pasture system. So that's a little bit about how we got to where we are today. Thanks, Austin. Let's dig into some of these pieces a little bit further. 
Actually, a, a bit more on the context. Can you tell us a little bit about the scale that you're operating on currently? Or maybe that's not the best way to ask that question, but how many acres have you planted at this point and how many acres are you expecting to work with over the course of the next several years? So, so far we've done, I think it's about 400 acres. I'd have to go back and look and see uh, exactly what our acreage count is to date. But I do know that we've planted trees on 25 farms, all active uh, farms. So not hobby farms, not homesteads, not rich people farms um, where they don't really care about the production. These are all active working farms, most of them dairies. And 90% of our projects so far have been in one county. It's been Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, and anything outside of that is in just the neighboring counties within the one hour radius of where we are located. So, and uh, our context a little bit more is we don't have really big farms around here. Our farms range from anywhere from 40 acres to 200 acres is our largest farm that we've worked with. Um, and we are now doing the second and third phase plantings on several of our farms. So we've got 25 farms that we've done so far, and then we have another 12, 15 going in next spring. And the, the speed at which we're doing plantings is only going up from there. Yeah, and for our listeners, if you're not familiar with the local context of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, it's home to the uh, one of the largest Amish communities, I think the third largest Amish community in the world. And so this is reflected in the smaller smaller farm size and very intensive management. And as you can imagine, with thirty to fifty thousand an acre land cost, there is there is no margin for poor management. That that's been that ceased to exist some time ago. <laughs> exactly. We don't in our area. So we focus on planting trees into pastures because most of our area is open pastures, right? We don't have woodlots that people have left except for on the the least accessible land um, and we don't have brush to thin to create silver pasture no one lets their land grow up in brush around here yeah doesn't exist it's uh, it's an interesting landscape to drive through. it's a beautiful landscape to drive through but very manicured <laughs> yep <laughs> very manicured yeah so the good news about this because of the management intensity and because of the cost of land what you're describing the scenario that you're describing the work that you're doing austin is if the way that I think about it is if it can be applicable and relevant and add value in that type of an economic environment, it's justifiable almost anywhere. And um, that's, I'm looking forward to getting into that discussion with you a little bit. Uh, but let's talk about the, the establishment process. Planting trees in pasture where you're grazing livestock sounds like a challenge to me because livestock love trees and young trees. So what's the establishment process look like and how do you get this to work on a working farm? Yep. It's thankfully it's not rocket science. Uh, if it was, I would not have figured it out. So the, our system is, is fairly simple. And, and this is the system that we use for most of our projects. And depending on your context, you can adapt it. You can do use different protection methods, but this is the system that we have developed is we use a six foot tall tree shelter. And that shelter has a plastic tube and a fiberglass stake. The upside of a fiberglass stake is it does not rot. It is flexible if cattle do rub up against it, and it's an electrical insulator. So that tube is what protects the tree from browse. And then we run electric fencing along rows of trees. So we usually are establishing trees in long rows, and we're running electric fencing along those rows of trees. And there's different ways that we can configure the, the fencing. Sometimes we'll run it at the, the height of a paddock division fence. Um, and then we just use a single strand of fencing. Sometimes we will wrap a, a strand of poly wire around that tube as well to protect the entire tube from being rubbed up against. So that's, that's the very basics of our system. And then voles are something that we deal with, uh, little rodents that like to girdle our trees. Uh, orchards deal with this all the time, and we just need to dissolve for a little bit differently because we're in uh, organically managed uh, farms. And there's a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of forages, a whole lot of places for those voles to hide. So we can't do clean culture and there's a whole lot of forages to work around. So 
what we use to protect against voles, at least now, is we use a, a 9, 10 inch spiral guard. Cause it's a vinyl guard that protects the base of the tree from girdling. And then every fall we put we go around and we put castor oil. Uh, it's a combination of castor oil and blood meal inside of that the tree tube to try to repel voles inside of there. Um, so that's what we're doing for voles. And then you layer on a really big thick layer of mulch, uh, wood chip mulch, on top of the trees right around the base to get them a good start, get a more fungal environment going, and conserve the moisture right around the tree. So that's the basic way that we've developed to get trees established in pastures. You're conserving moisture and you're also avoiding moisture competition with the grasses and the forages that are around them, which are very effective at, uh, at sucking all the moisture out of, out of the soil. How effective, you described your wool management process, uh, how effective has that been for you? I wish I could say that we've had a long time to study this. Last winter was the first winter that we went through with those spiral guards on all of our trees. All of our new trees that we put in the ground last year, we were able to go through the winter and see, and we had very, very, very little vole damage on those trees, which is great. And it's a big difference from previous years where you'll come up to a tree that's six, seven, eight feet tall in the spring, and you, you admire it and you give a little bit of a pull and the whole tree comes up from the roots because it's been girdled all the way through. Last year we did not see that. Now those spiral guards are providing uh, protection from above ground girdling and that's where the castor oil product comes in is that is supposed to repel below ground rodents, gophers, moles, that kind of thing. So that's what we're using there. I don't know how it'll work but it, it's an added layer of of protection and i'll buy any insurance that i can against voles i uh i want to also speak about the establishment costs and population densities and, and some more of the nuance of how you're building this out but i think in order to have the context for that conversation we first need to speak about uh what are the desired outcomes what are the what are the goals so when you think about farmers planting trees on land that's worth $50,000 an acre. We've spent the last several hundred years removing every tree possible from land that has that type of economic value. So what are, what are the desired outcomes? What are the goals that these farmers are expecting to achieve from planting trees on pasture? Absolutely. So envision, if you would, a savanna ecosystem with a combination of grasslands and trees interspersed widely throughout that system. That's about what we're aiming for. So we're not looking to recreate a forest because the, again, these, all of our clients are, they're grass farmers, whether they're doing dairy or beef or sheep or whatever that they're, they're raising, they depend on forages. So we're not looking to recreate a woods, but we also don't want a wide open space without trees because trees can provide certain key benefits to these grazing operations. So the number one thing that brings most of our clients to us is shade. Livestock just perform better when they have access to shade. And when it comes to shade, what we want to avoid is having shade being distributed in too small of an area. So where uh, you say you have one tree or just a handful of trees or maybe a row, like a, a row that's the edge of a woodlot where the livestock can go for heat stress relief, but then they're moving all of those nutrients underneath that one tree or in that, into that one area and they're over compacting and overusing that one area. So what we want to do is we want to create a silvopasture system where the shade is well dispersed through the pasture. We can do that through planting our trees fairly evenly. We can do that through having trees with a fairly small canopy. So we prune off those lower limbs and create a fairly small canopy that is high up on the tree, as high up as we can reasonably get. That would make the shade move around. Exactly, exactly. So that's the kind of system that we want to create. So, and so the shade is what brings most people to us, but any tree can provide shade. So we want to select for trees that are going to provide shade plus additional benefits. So that can be 
honey locusts that are going to drop pods in November, December, January and add additional feed energy during the winter time. It can be persimmons that are going to do a similar thing, but with fruit. I was talking yesterday to some farmers who were very excited. Actually, Alvin Peachy, um, who you've had on this this podcast before, he was very excited about being able to have uh, apples and uh, and even mulberries and persimmons and things that are going to drop could bring wildlife in and particularly a large deer. Um, and that's a, that's a very common thing that we see is. Uh, wanting to integrate trees both for the livestock but then also for wildlife whether that's deer and hunting or that's birds or or whatever like a whole bunch of our our clients want just to see more habitat want to see more biodiversity on their farms but so shade and then feed during critical times of the year i should stress this that what we want to see is we want to see these trees be able to reduce input costs and increase output for the farm itself. We're not really focused on tree crops for human consumption. On a homestead scale, yes, I think every farm should have some trees for homestead use, for homestead resiliency, but most of our focus is on reducing the cost of doing business on that farm and increasing the economic output on that farm. So take honey locusts. A good pasture of honey locusts can produce hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of of feed, additional feed, depending on how many trees that you're planting per acre, that is able to create and um, add an energy source, a high energy source during those months when our forages are low in energy and livestock need more energy in order to, to keep condition during the winter months. Um, and the same thing would apply to others, persimmons, if someone is feeding hogs or poultry, then we can add in mulberries or acorns or chestnuts or a whole a whole variety, especially when it comes to hogs, because they can eat just about anything. And again, our goal is to reduce the feed cost for those and be able to have a stronger bottom line for the farm operation. There's so many pieces that you've mentioned, Austin, that I'd like to unwrap further. But I think the, the key central point is you mentioned reducing inputs, but then really the, the line that really catches my attention is uh, increasing profitability. And so there is, I think many people have this uh, inherent question. When you think about planting trees close by crops or into pasture, there is almost this inherent assumption that the presence of trees is going to reduce yields. And uh, I, I have some thoughts on that that I want to share as well, but I'd like to get your perspective on what do you see happening to, there's of course, you described the additional value, which I also want to get into of, of the additional calories that these tree crops can provide themselves. But what do you see happening to the yields and the overall crop performance of the underlying forage base? I'll say this, that we as a business have not been doing this long enough to see a lot of effect on our projects. So our first civil pasture planting was in spring of 2020. So it's now just finished its fourth growing season. So in the scheme of things, not very long for trees. But from the research that I've looked at, Virginia Tech in particular has done quite a bit of research on forage production in civil pasture systems. They have found that if you get shade anywhere in the 30 to 50% range, so 30 to 50% canopy cover, that you're seeing about the same forage production and you should see stronger growth during the summer months in particular. Most of our clients are grazing cool season perennial forages. And as the name suggests, those forages want to be cool. They don't want to be over overheated. Um, so they experience heat stress during the summer months, just like livestock experience heat stress during the summer months. So by having a moderate shade, again, we're not looking to recreate a forest, but by having a moderate level of shade, we're able to reduce the heat stress on those cool season perennial forages and allow them to grow better during those summer months, which is the most critical time of the year, most critical time of the growing season, I should say. Most farmers don't need additional forages during the spring, right? There's so much forage that you can't even keep up with them. Um, and it's during those summer months that you experience the summer slump and having some 
some shade, especially during periods of drought, are particularly valuable. One of our consultants, he has his own farm that he established silvo pasture on a number of years ago, and so the trees are a little bit more mature. And last year, we saw a pretty significant drought in his area. And he noted that the forages grew the best in the morning shade of his tallest trees because the dew was able to settle there and be more effectively used than the rest of the forages. So that's just one small anecdote. Well, the anecdote matches with, uh, and the experience you're describing, it matches with what I am learning about uh, how plants respond to light, how plants respond to excessive light. And you know, when we think about the simple phenomena of, of our yards and how grass grows around trees in, in landscaped areas, it can depend on the tree species. That certainly has an impact and also on how the grass is managed and maintained. But if you have grass with a uh, well-developed, robust root system, in other words, it's not cut off an inch and a half above the soil surface, and you have trees that aren't providing excessive shade, then the grass actually grows more luxuriously and better underneath the trees than it does anywhere else in the lawn. Like I've, I've observed this dozens of times and I've been learning this. There's this interesting phenomena where it's also related to the summer heat period. I, I'm beginning to realize that it's not just the heat stress, but there is in fact such a thing as excess of light. And that when you have too much light coming in, the plants are not able to utilize all of it and actually induces stress on the crop as well. And this is why uh, nurseries and greenhouses commonly put shade on, this is why tomato high tunnels put shade on their tunnels during the summer months is because the shade the, uh, and limiting sunlight, and again, it's in the exact same range, 30 to 40% shade on a shade cloth or, or coverage of by paint has a dramatically yield increasing effect and a positive effect on tomato production or on flower production in greenhouses. So this is actually, it's not a surprise. I think that uh, many of our field crops would actually benefit from some shade during the summer months. Interesting. Now, John, I wanted to pick your brain here a little bit since you have me on the podcast and I have your ear for a minute is I know very, very little about the microbiological interactions um, that are happening in the soil and happening between plants. And I'm curious to hear what insights you might have about the the beneficial, potentially negative interactions between trees and forages. So specifically, what would you see as some of the benefits on the microbiology in particular of integrating trees into a pasture system that previously did not have them? I I don't know that the research has been done or I haven't encountered it. So the best answer that I can give is a is a is an informed guess. And that informed guess is simply to say that as a general rule of thumb, increased species diversity and uh, increased diversity of, of different plants in a landscape almost always lends to increased microbial population diversity. And that increased microbial population diversity almost always, in fact, I can't think of a single instance where increased diversity has a negative effect or an effect on, let's say, increasing disease susceptibility. In fact, it's always the opposite. The more species diversity you have in the microbial population, the more of a disease suppressive soil you have. And uh, disease suppressive soil is is a, a scientifically correct terminology and it, it emphasizes the disease management and the pathogen management aspect, but there is this associated benefit that when you have soils that have such vigorous microbial populations that they suppress disease, those exact same soils are also very effective at delivering nutrients to plants. And so when you think about microbial populations supplying 100% of a crop's nutritional requirements, it is these soils that are these disease suppressive soils that are the most effective at doing so. And frequently, those are soils that have the, the benefit of having lots of species diversity of plant species above the soil surface. And so that's a very broad macro answer. I think obviously tree species have different microbial symbionts than the others. They are, they're a very unique outlier is not quite the word that I'm looking for, but they, they have a very different microbial 
profile that they're associated with than the Forbes and the Forages that would be present. And so I would expect, and this is again just a guess or an assumption, but I would expect that the addition of more woody species will have a compounding beneficial effect and not an additive effect. In other words, it's a case where adding one species isn't a case of one plus one. It's a case of one plus one equaling 11 and not two. But that's, that's just based on observational experience and a best guess. I don't have data to support a single thing that I just got done saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to seeing the data come out in the years to come as more of these systems roll out and more people have opportunity to study them. Yeah, we now have technology. I've been so excited to have uh, Dr. Laura Cavanaugh join our team at uh, Advancing Eco Agriculture because... What she is bringing to the agricultural space is handheld sensors that you can take into the field or you can very easily collect samples and take them to a local center and measure the complete soil and plant microbiome and everything that is total population of all the DNA that has been identified so far, total DNA analysis, 6 million plus species in a matter of minutes for a very, very affordable cost. We haven't even priced this out, but I know it's going to be, I don't know, $50 to $70 neighborhood or less, perhaps significantly less. So all of a sudden... Handheld in the field. Yes. Wow. I say handheld. Probably would be more accurate to say pick up tailgate uh, appropriate, but small scale, miniature suitcase sized. And so, yeah, it's... uh, Once we have that technology and it's affordable and easy and anyone with a a reasonable minimal level of training can measure microbiomes, we're going to have much more high fidelity data than we do at this point. So it'll be interesting to see what all that research reveals. That sounds great. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, coming back to, uh, we were, we were on the topic of uh, the potential of shade increasing yields of the underlying forages from both a light sensitivity and uh, a moisture perspective and the, the benefits that that can have. Let's talk a, a bit about the species, the tree species that you perceive as having the greatest opportunity, the greatest potential impact and what that looks like from a, from a forage potential. And I'm, this is a topic that I've been interested in for years because probably over a decade ago, I forget the exact time of it, we started working with apple producers who were producing apples for processing instead of for fresh market. And that was... A fascinating perspective because all of a sudden the, the fruit doesn't have to be perfect anymore. It doesn't have to be absolutely blemish free. And so the pesticide applications reduced it dramatically. The pruning could also be different because you didn't require perfect light penetration to the canopy and perfect fruit coloration. And they could allow the fruit to drop to the ground and then pick it up from the ground. And the yield numbers were very different. All of a sudden, you started uh, managing pruning trees slightly differently, letting more fruit hang on the tree. The fruit can be smaller. All of a sudden, we're talking about yields that range anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 bushels per acre and as high as 1,800 to 2,000 in some exceptional instances. And I started doing the math about the calorie production from a field of trees like that. And then I started looking at the math of calorie production from chestnuts and from mulberries. I started wondering, wait a minute, why are we growing grass again exactly? <laughs> and so I'd love to get your perspective on, uh, I know you're, you're very passionate about honey locusts because of the seasonality and the impacts that the uh, synergies that they offer. So what are the species with, uh, with the greatest forage yield potential, and the greatest opportunity from your perspective? So what I'll do is I'll break this up into a couple different categories that we commonly use. So the first category that we use is actually our trees that are there primarily for shade and primarily for quick shade. So these would be hybrid poplars, hybrid willows, black locusts. Those are our three main trees that we use in our area. And they're applicable across a large portion of the United States. Those trees are there, again, for for a quick shade on a real budget. Those are, they're cheap trees. They are hardy, resilient, they just want to grow. With our willows and our poplars in particular, 
what we're able to do now that we have our own nursery and we have some established stock, we're able to come into a farm with a live stake. So that's basically a branch from a tree that is 10, 12, 14 feet tall. We put it in the ground two, three feet, and then you have a 10 foot tall tree that is ready to go. It's gonna make its own roots and it's gonna get established that way. So very inexpensive way to get shade really fast. We're seeing where if we come in with a uh, 12 foot tall live stake, we're able to see actual shade that is usable by the livestock in the second year, the second growing season. So those are the trees that we use for our really fast shade on a budget. And those, those are also the trees that we recommend to folks to start with because they're cheap, they're easy, they're forgiving. If you kill one of those, it's really no problem because they're cheap to replace. Don't start with a $40 grafted honey locust or whatever it is. Start with a $2 hybrid poplar. So that's our first category. Our second category is the trees that we use for ruminants. So mostly that is, or so our, our long-term trees for feed for ruminants, I should clarify. So mostly that's honey locust and persimmon. So honey locust is the tree that I think has the highest potential upside for ruminant silvopasture in a large chunk of the United States because there's a couple of things to its benefit. One, it's a nitrogen fixer. It has a very nice dappled canopy so that it allows a lot of light to come through the canopy and still hit the forages beneath. And then the third thing is what we already discussed is being able to drop those high energy pods. And on wild pods, you're looking at 17, 20% energy or 20% sugar, I should say. And then on more selected varieties, you're looking at 30, 35, 38% sugar in those pods. So being able to wow. increase the amount of feed energy going into winter. You know, one of the pieces I remember about honey locusts is in the uh, book uh, Tree Crops. Who was the author? Russell Smith? J. Russell Smith. J. Russell Smith. Um, in that book, he described, this is a book that's what, written back in the early 1900s. He described the... 1927, I believe. Yeah. He described the potential of honey locusts to be grown as a sugar crop. And, you know, at 30 to 40 percent sugar content, um, something that's dropped under the ground and has minimal um, would be relatively easy to harvest is uh, I think sugar sugar isn't as cheap anymore as it was a decade ago or even five years ago. And uh, the economics of that might be worth exploring. But anyway, sorry for the digression. The easiest thing for us is most of our systems are based on the livestock being able to harvest whatever is dropped themselves. That's the beauty of it, is the livestock will go out there and they'll pick up the pods off the ground, they'll pick up the persimmons off the ground. I will note for those people who are right now raising the question of honey locust, why in the world would I plant honey locust? Because they're familiar with the wild honey locust that has amazing and impressive and dangerous thorns on it so <laughs> anyone who's not familiar with honey locust look it up um, because they're, they're pretty nasty thorns they can get to a foot long or even longer compound thorns very sharp something you don't want to interact with you don't want to have it in your pastures um, even the the most zealous tree hugger would not hug these trees <laughs> thankfully there is a way to get those thorns out of the trees. Um, so it's a, gen it's a genetic thing, largely. So there are, if you go to a farm that has honey locust, most farms you will also see thornless honey locust on that farm. I've been to uh, farms out in the Midwest where there's a lot of honey locusts on those farms and then I've seen tr um, trees with thorns all the way up and down on the, on the trunk, all the way up into the canopy. You're referring to just natively. Just native, yep, correct. There's been very, very little work done to improve honey locusts in general over the last hundred years, except for like ornamental street trees. There's seedlings on those same farms that only had thorns in the branches, some that only had thorns on the trunk, and some that were completely thornless all the way up and down. And so what we're doing is we are selecting for known thornless trees and clonally propagating those trees so that what we are planting out on pastures is completely thornless. 
So I'll, I'll say that as a caveat for those people who rightly have questions about honey locust is we want the right trees, the right genetics to be integrating into our pasture systems. And so the other tree there is, is persimmons. So uh, again, so persimmons are going to drop their fruit, and the fruit, uh, for those who aren't familiar, is about the size of a golf ball, um, more or less, depending on the variety. And they'll drop their fruit anywhere from as early as August out to as late as January, February, and some will even hold on to their fruit a little bit longer. So with persimmons, we have the opportunity to really uh, stretch our drop season over a long period of time, and we can choose varieties that drop early if we want that, and we can choose varieties that drop during the dead of winter if that is our goal. And the nice thing is that persimmons don't have uh, thorns on them. They don't grow very fast, which is a challenge, um, but they don't have thorns on them, which makes them a lot more appealing to, to more people, and, or people don't have the, uh, the, the frightening effect of, of honey locust. So that's the second category, is those trees for ruminants. And then if you go into a system where you have hogs and poultry, and, and I'll, I'll talk about hogs in particular because they can eat a lot more than poultry can, is then you're looking at mulberries. Before we go to speaking about trees for hogs and, and for poultry, I'd like to just quickly follow up on what is the, what's the yield potential or what is the forage potential of persimmons and honey locusts? Like how much feed value can they generate? So I should start off with this answer by saying that there's very, very limited data on how much feed can be offset or how, or how much livestock feed can be offset or how much feed these trees can produce. Very limited data. And largely because it just takes a long time to set up a study like this. Most universities are not in the place where they can plant trees and then 10, 15, 20 years later run a study on the production of those trees, especially trees that are not near as popular and, and not for human consumption like peaches or apples or, or plums or something like that. They're not perceived as being as economically impactful for the economy as a whole. Exactly. Yep. Livestock focused trees do not get a whole lot of attention. So with that caveat, I'm going back to the book that we referenced, uh, J. Russell Smith's Tree Crops. And in that book, for persimmons in particular, he says, he talks about um, in Kansas, being able to get four to five bushels of persimmons in a year. So if you scale that up and you plant trees on a 30 by 30 spacing, and you have 48 trees, um, you could be looking at 200, 240 bushels of persimmons per year. Now, if we want to compare those to corn, because corn is a useful comparison that a lot of people understand, you'd have to adjust for the moisture in the corn and the moisture in the persimmons, which is going to be higher than the moisture in the corn. So it brings your numbers down to roughly equivalent of 100 bushels of corn equivalent per acre coming off of your persimmon trees. And this would be very low input system. Practically none, really. Practically no input. But then, yeah, there is also the key aspect we don't want to lose sight of is that the livestock can pick them up off the ground at a time of the year when they really need the energy and can benefit from that. Exactly. So your, your input, your, your labor inputs, your financial inputs into this system are absolutely minimal and you're able to at the same time produce a full crop of forages underneath those trees. Yeah, how about for honey locust? So on honey locust, there's probably even less research done on those. But there was a study done in the 1940s, the very early 40s and unfortunately it was cut off uh, like a lot of tree crops research because of World War II. But at the age of 7 to 10 years old, if we look at the, the yield over that time period for these grafted honey locust trees, they were averaging a yield of about 95 pounds of pods, and this is dry matter. So 95 pounds of dry matter per year over that time frame. So 95 pounds for trees that were seven to 10 years old. So not old trees at all. They were well taken care of. So if you have a density of here in, in my paper, I wrote uh, 36 trees per acre, you're looking at 3,400 
and 20 pounds of pods annually coming off of uh, that, that acre for honey locust. Wow. And given the energy content, if you're talking 30 to 40% sugar content, that is a lot of calories per acre. That's a significant energy yield. Yes, indeed. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's why I'm optimistic about the, the, the upside of, of silvopasture and its broad applicability. All right. So you were about to move on to speaking about trees for hogs and poultry. Tell us about what the opportunities are there. So there, if you're raising hogs or poultry, most people, even raising, uh, say, let's say pastured pigs, most of their diet is still going to be coming from from imported or from from grain, right? Feed that is brought onto the farm. And so we have a real opportunity to reduce our feed costs. And given that these are monogastrics, they are not ruminants, so they are not meant to have uh, their full feed coming off of, of forages. They can supplement with forages. But in the wild, our wild boar are not grazing on grasslands. Our chickens are not domesticated from prairie chickens. They're domesticated from jungle fowl. This is the this is the habitat that they want to be in. This is what creates a low stress environment for them. Uh, hogs do much better. Poultry do much better when they are not heat stressed. So there's a lot of reasons to integrate trees in general, and then we might as well integrate trees that are going to provide additional feed. So mulberry is one that we look to for both hogs and poultry. And mulberry is really nice because it is easy to propagate, it is inexpensive, it grows really fast, it transplants well, and it'll start to yield it'll start to yield immediately. Like once you graft a mulberry, it wants to set fruit that very first year. So in terms of a quick return on investment for tree planting, mulberry is really hard to beat. And then not only does it drop high quality, high energy fruit, but the the leaves of a mulberry plant are also very digestible and very high in protein. Similar protein content as clovers and uh, similar digestibility as well. Uh, So digestible that even humans can eat it. Um, so in certain cultures, mulberry leaves are used similar to like a, a grape leaf. When you have a, when you wrap rice or something like that in a grape leaf, you can do the same thing with mulberry leaves. So a very multifunctional tree for use with, with hogs and with poultry. And then hogs can eat just about anything. So acorns, chestnuts, beech nuts, apples, pears, plums, just the whole gamut that they can consume and make good use of on the farm. And uh, when, I, when I stop to think about it, I'm actually curious. Well, there's two questions that come to mind, but uh, why not apples and chestnuts for ruminants? Why did you exclude those from the list? Yeah, so, and we might integrate more of those in the years to come. The challenge with apples in particular, um, and this applies to other fruits that are fairly that are perishable more perishable and drop during the the warmer seasons of the year is that if you're in a system where you're rotationally grazing and you're not coming back through for 30 40 50 days whatever it is if a fruit falls and your livestock aren't through in the next five days for a mulberry in the summer or maybe it's 10, 20 days for apples in September, October, the feed value, you're you're losing a large chunk of that feed value. So that's the the complexity of integrating some of those trees into a ruminant system with uh, long rotational grazing uh, cycles. Now you could set it up in such a way that you could, you would have a, let's say a paddock that the cattle can regularly go to, um, but then they would need to regularly go to that paddock over the course of the drop season. So we haven't yet designed some of those systems. You could, but then there, there would be some downsides to them as well. The nice thing about honey locust is once they drop, they drop in November, December, and those pods are going to be there until livestock come back around. Well, let's talk about this for a bit. Let's talk about chestnuts first. Wouldn't the same be true for chestnuts, that they would drop and remain stable on the ground for an extended period? They would probably stay better than apples. I'm sure that they would stay better than apples, but less than honey locust. What I've seen so far would suggest that 
chestnut yields are going to be lower than honey locusts. I've heard from various growers anywhere from a range of 1,000 pounds per acre to 4,000 pounds per acre, depending on the site conditions and whatnot. Um, and then when you adjust for moisture, so that would be that would be a fresh, fresh weight. And I think chestnuts are about uh, 40 or 50 percent moisture, uh, if I remember correctly, off the top of my head. Yeah, the downside, of course, you also have the burrs to deal with as well, which is never uh, particularly fun. But I, I'm actually. Uh... Well, I have limited experience, but the experience, the limited experience that I do have suggests that anyone that's producing less than a minimum two or 3,000 pounds per acre of chestnuts on relatively young trees uh, needs to get on the AEA program <laughs> because <Sounds good. laughs> there's lots of opportunity left <laughs> on that table. <laughs> Sounds good. And I'm, I look forward to seeing as we get to that point where we are we've figured out some of these basic things of how to get trees established. I'm looking forward to seeing how can we make these systems really sing and really produce. Yeah, that those uh, really 6,000 or 8,000 pounds per acre of chestnuts is not, is not a difficult stretch. Now, of course, uh, I'm also, I need to offer the caveat that I'm thinking of that in terms of chestnut production, not in terms of silo pasture. And so there is some, there will be a reduction there proportionally. Yeah, most of our systems are gonna be low input low input right. where the trees are more or less secondary um, rather than a, a primary production interest to our growers. I'm also talking about low input, but I'm not talking about no input. Like it's, you can do some very minimal levels of management that will make some significant differences. But let's talk about apples because there is something that many people don't know about apples. Uh, first of all, as I'm sure you're aware, apples have this tremendous genetic variability and genetic diversity. And one of the characteristics of some strains of apples that can be selected for is that you can actually select apples to be held onto the tree and to drop at different times of the year, just as with persimmons. And there are folks who have done some very innovative uh, selection and breeding work who have apples that are being held on the tree all the way into the middle of the winter, uh, January and February before they drop. And so this is going to require some careful selection and uh, working with a breeding pool that isn't that extensive right now. But there's still there is the possibility to really extend the drop window of apples, just as you do with persimmons. That, that makes sense. I mean, if you look at even crab apples right now, we're almost into December, and there's still plenty of crab apples hanging onto the trees. So that that makes sense to me, and it just hasn't hasn't crossed our radar yet. So, and John, I want to go back to what you were saying earlier about the difference between orchards, apple orchards for cider and apple orchards for fresh consumption. You gave us some numbers about the yield that you could see on cider orchards, but I'm not being familiar with orchards for fresh production myself. Could you compare what you could typically see on an orchard that's managed for fresh production and what that difference looks like? Well, fresh production, uh, there's, of course, variation from variety to variety and management practices, tree density, tree age. I mean, there's all types of variables, but 50 bins an acre is a, is a reasonable average target or about, that's a, that would be a 20 bushel bin, so that's 1,000 bushel per acre. And the processor apples were running anywhere from 30 to 70% above that on similar soil types and densities. Yeah. And that's, they required less management, less pruning intensity, less, and that, that is one thing, you know, I'm going to take a slight divergence here. I think we uh, do not appreciate and really understand the, uh, the potential that exists with trees in a relatively unmanaged system. And so I'm going to share a story that I find fascinating. I, I uncovered this story when I was trying to understand peaches. And peaches were the second invasive species in North America. Hernando de Soto, when he came to Florida, brought hogs and peaches. And peaches were adapted by the Native Americans and they became a staple part of the native diet all the way from the Finger Lakes area of New York to Canyon Duche in New Mexico and the American Southwest and all points in between. So peaches became this widespread prevalent crop and then and peaches grew like a weed throughout all of the eastern seaboard, the high rainfall area throughout the Appalachians. There was 
prior to, I would say roughly around 1940, 1950, prior to that period, you would read about peach thickets. So in certain geographic areas, when they cleared out a forest, what grew back would be a peach thicket. And today we talk about plum thickets in those same uh, ranges. But it didn't used to be plum thickets, it used to be peach thickets. And so I'm particularly interested in understanding the question of why the change, what happened, why did the peaches disappear? But that's, that's a bit of a separate discussion. The point that I wanted to make is that uh, in the summer of 1778, I think, plus or minus a year or two, George Washington sent an army with specific commands and orders to destroy the sustenance of the Oneida and the Cayuga tribes in the Finger Lakes area of New York because they had sided with the British during the Revolutionary War. And he wanted to destroy their food sources. So the military uh, an army uh, went up to the Finger Lakes area and several soldiers kept uh, records in their diaries of, of the work that they were doing. And they described uh, destroying an orchard of intermixed apples and cherries and peaches, thousands of trees. And these were all seedling trees that were planted in the ground that just the seeds grew uh, and they harvested whatever fruit showed up. So there was a lot of genetic diversity, but they recorded peaches that were 13 inches in circumference. And with no disease, I mean, these several of these soldiers described how this had the appearance of a Garden of Eden, like this was a paradise with acres and acres of these trees spread out and they cut them all down. So, oh, the point that I wanted to make is that there is this, this uh, belief that trees need to be grafted and that we need to care for them, that we need to prune them. And when I look at how a tree behaves and expresses itself from a physiological perspective, of course, there's a, a tremendous range of genetic um, diversity here. But from my perspective, once you graft a tree, you really screw with its hormonal balance. And so there is an element almost, uh, and this, this is too broad of a generalization to be entirely accurate, but you could, you could broadly generalize by saying that once you graft a tree, uh, an apple tree specifically, you're required to prune it for the rest of its life. And so I'm intrigued by the question. It's an open question. No one is looking at this or studying at this right now, but what if we planted apple seeds instead of apple trees. And how would that change management? So all of a sudden, if you no longer needed to prune, we look at all the wild crab apple trees that are growing around. Do they have a perfect form? Are they optimized for fruit production? No, not necessarily, but do they produce fruit? Oh yes, absolutely. In some cases, a lot of fruit. And so if you use that type of management system for apple trees as a part of a silviculture uh, system, you would eliminate the need for pruning, you eliminate the need for spraying, uh, and you would have a very different uh, management protocol. But anyway, that is, uh, that's an idea that remains unexplored as far as I know. We'll be looking at things like that. I don't know. At this point, we don't have a rigorous research and scientific part to what we do. Uh, we're very simple boots on the ground type operation, but that's the kind of research that we want to be doing more in the years to come as we're able to integrate more of those more of those types of trees and as our nursery grows and we have the the scope within our nursery to be able to get that silvopasture specific stock out there that currently there is no market for so there's not very many people buying and planting seedling apples out there but that's one of those things that we do indeed want to do yeah awesome all right well actually since you say buying and planting seedling apples i'm going to put uh, a needle in that balloon I think uh, I, I made the comment that um, once you prune a tree, you need to, or once you graft it, you need to prune it for the rest of its life because you've really messed with the hormonal balance. And I'd say that's equally true for pruning the root system. So I think those seedlings really need to be planted in place. And that, of course, is a lot more difficult from an establishment perspective. You, see, you say putting the seed right in the ground where it needs to be exactly. long term that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the challenge there is is the establishment process. Yep. Livestock yep. love apple seedlings. <laughs> yes, they do. So I think this brings us all the way around the circle back to where I kicked things off is that uh, in the, the establishment process. I want to understand and talk a little bit about the establishment costs. 
What does your tree density look like per acre for these various species? Is there variation from species to species? And, and what are the establishment costs? So tree density ranges anywhere from, let's say, a low end of about 20 trees per acre to a higher end. You can go as high as you want, but typically our plantings are more of the 60, 70 trees per acre as the high end of that density. And as I've mentioned before, we like to integrate both fast growing shade trees and slower growing trees that are going to be there for a long term and have that balance. And if you're in a context where you can plant at a lower density, maybe plant some taller trees that are already already six, seven, eight feet tall and they're say a honey locust and a persimmon that are going to be there long term, then you can plant fewer trees per acre, maybe on that 20 to 30 trees per acre spectrum um, and have a lower cost per acre that way because you're not planting as many of those fast growing shade trees that you're going to remove after a number of years. So the, and the cost per tree, if we look at the cost of a tree shelter, uh, the more that you buy, the greater discount, but let's say about $10 as a rough number for one of those tree shelters. The tree, it can be anywhere from a $2 seedling all the way up to a $50 grafted tree. So it really depends on, on what kind of stock that you're going after. And I should say here that our goal with Trees for Grazers is in the years to come to develop a nursery where we are able to sell to the general public. At, at this point, we are not selling to the general public. Um, we're only using our trees on our, on our own projects. But our goal is to be able to sell uh, silvopasture specific trees with the right genetics and the right size of tree to match each context. So there's a big variable that in what tree you decide to plant on your cost. And then your labor, um, we've, on our projects, we're typically planting anywhere from two to three trees per per hour, per person, per person hour. Um, because most of our stuff happens by hand. Our trees are, are far apart. We're digging a hole, you're planting the tree, you're putting the shelter on, um, you're stringing up the poly wire, you're putting the mulch on, the whole thing. So, and then you can depend, you can decide how much labor costs that you attribute to that if it's, if it's you or if you get a contractor in. And then that's, that's the basics of it. So the tree, the shelter, the labor, um, and then mulch on top of that is again, however much labor that you attribute to that. Most of, most people can get uh, wood chips for a pretty low cost. So what programs are available to offset these costs? I know you mentioned you got into this project from uh, the perspective of, uh, of populating riparian buffers and um, I'm guessing that there's probably some similar things available like this for silvopasture as well though perhaps uh, to a sm much smaller degree. What does that process look like? Exactly. That process has been somewhat frustrating to find the right cost share for this. So in our area, Lancaster County, again, we have a lot of water quality related problems and there's a lot of water quality related funding available in our area. So that's been our saving grace is that we've been able to apply for grants um, to plant these trees. We're in an area in, at this point in Pennsylvania, there's no NRCS support for silvopasture. NRCS would be the entity that in many states has pretty significant support for a silvopasture. In some of the Midwestern states, there's about $30, $35 per tree that can be used for cost share. And that's going to that's going to cover um, a good chunk of your costs um, with establishing silvopasture. Some of the other states more in the eastern side of the United States have some cost share, but not not strong cost share, about as much as you would need to get uh, like a pine silvopasture established, which for most of our grazers is not something that's at all interesting. So the cost share is spotty at this point. I suspect, I firmly believe that the amount of cost share that's available will increase in the years to come. And largely that's going to come be driven through public policy that's there to support what they call climate smart agricultural practices. And when you look at the practices that can sequester the most carbon, silvopasture is usually ranked as the number one 
practice on agricultural lands. So because of that, I anticipate a lot more funding coming to support the practice in the years to come. Awesome. Austin, when you think back about uh, your journey and the learning journey that you've been on, uh, you know, so often as we go through life, we can look back and we can reflect on pivotal moments, experiences, observations, or stories that really stand out in our mind. Uh, What are some of those experiences that you've had over the last uh, 10 years of your journey that really have inspired you and, and have given you some idea of the potential and the implications for these civil pasture systems. Mm. Mm. That's one thing for us to talk about. We're, we're talking about numbers and data and all that is important, but it's, it's also, it's the stories that we remember. Yeah. So one that comes to mind for me is talking with some of our early farmers that we were using, we were just experimenting at this point with how can we get trees established in a pasture in a reasonable way. And uh, the farmer said to me that he, ever since he moved onto the farm or took control of the farm, that he's wanted to get trees established. Um, and that was about 20 years ago at that point. Uh, and I think this is the case for a lot of farmers, especially grazers, right? Uh, people who graze livestock out on pasture, they recognize the benefit of trees. They see um, that their livestock prefer being in the shade. But for a variety of reasons, most farmers do not get those trees established. There's a whole laundry list of things to do on a farm. Um, It's usually 10 pages long and half of those things should have been done a year ago or even five years ago. It's just how it is on the farm. There's always an unending list of things to do. And planting trees never gets to the top of that list. And for those who do, oftentimes it is met with with frustration because there's a whole lot of things, like we said earlier, that want to kill and eat trees and smother them up. So most farmers, even if they if it's in their their ethics, in their economic interest to establish trees, they just don't. It it never happens. Um, and that's that was one of the pivotal things for us to decide to to grow the business to grow our reach of services so that we can help those farmers actually make this practice happen it's not just providing more information Um, there information is out there it's spotty but there is enough information out there for a lot of farmers to be able to do this on their own but what we find is that it just doesn't happen unless there's the support that's needed and that's, that's why our goal is to make it as simple as possible for farmers to say yes to silvopasture. So we take care of the, the planning and consulting. We write a plan, a step-by-step and farm specific. We help farmers apply for funding because no one likes to go and wade through all that funding mess and, and all that paperwork by themselves. We have that silvopasture specific nursery where our goal is to grow tree stock that are really specific to silvopasture and to the needs of the farm. We do the planting and we do the aftercare. Um, So taking care of those trees for the first number of years that they're planted out in the field to make sure that they have the best chance of succeeding. I kind of relate it to, to, let's say, a solar business. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there weren't very many solar installers around. And right now, I myself, I could go up and I could install a solar panel on my roof and I could do that. I could probably do that today. But I don't have the time. I'm busy, busy planting trees, or, or rather, for my case, I'm busy doing the organization and admin behind tree, tree planting. So I'm busy, too busy to do solar. I don't have the know-how. I don't have the money to be able to put the upfront cash towards this. If I tried to wire in my own electric, I'd probably burn my house down. But now, as opposed to 30 years ago, I could call someone, any number of contractors, and they would come and they would install those solar panels on my house, and they would probably be able to put me up with a package that I don't have to pay any money up front. And I just pay a little bit every month for the duration of the lifespan of that solar panel. That's what I see for silvopasture is most farmers are too busy to do this themselves and don't have the right skill set or insight into the spe- very specific thing that we're trying to do. And if they can have services that are tailored to them, it makes a, a world of a difference. 
So like I said earlier, we've done 25 farms here just in this one small area and we have another whole bunch coming in the spring and a lot more to come in the years ahead. And that really speaks to the scale that silvopasture can be applied to if there's the right services and support for the practice in a region. Yeah, I think, yeah, your observations and your story is, is very astute. It's true, I think, for all of us in, in some areas of our lives, there are many things that we would like to do that we lack the bandwidth uh, and just never make it to the top of the priority list. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. So as it, it occurs to me that you have, um, you've developed a very different or unique perspective on pastures and tree management, and I'm sure perhaps that relates to farming in general, uh, what is a point of view that you've developed that is very different from the mainstream view? Yeah, I mean, from the mainstream, I'm far, far away. Um, <laughs> one of our one of our clients, I don't know if you know him, Roman Stolzfus, he's a uh, he's a leading uh, dairy grazing figure in this area. He said that on his farm, um, when he went to be all grass fed, he went he went out on a limb. And now, when he uh, went to planting trees in his pasture, it is perfectly fine open pasture his neighbors said that he was sawing the limb off the tree that he's out on a limb on um <laughs> so he's and, and that's about how i am for for the most part uh com compared to the mainstream but i'll say that compared to agroforestry in general we think differently about what we do what our focus is on um so our focus is specifically on integrating trees that are there to serve livestock. We don't really focus much on trees that are there for human consumption. So we're not looking at having chestnut orchards or apple cider orchards or currants or hazelnuts or, or the other tree species that are used in agroforestry for human consumption. We're focused on what I see as the most scalable practice which is silvopasture to support livestock. If you look at American agriculture in general right now, most of the land that's in production is not for human food, right? Most of the corn that's being grown is not for corn chips or for um, for tortillas. And our soybeans are not all for tofu. And in our pasture lands, obviously, they're there to support livestock. So most of our land is being, grown, is being used for livestock feed. Um, and that's a market that will has no real practical upper limit to the scalability of that practice so if you had a million acres of chestnuts you're going to have a glut in the chestnut market right you're going to have way too many chestnuts than, than can be used and sold if you have 10 million acres of honey locusts that are dropping feed for cattle that's just offsetting feed that would have otherwise been been grown and consumed by those cattle if you have 10 million acres of mulberries that are there dropping fruit and i should say i don't advocate for monocultures but to use a simple example um, if you have 10 million acres of mulberries dropping feed for hogs you're just going to reduce the amount of corn that's going into feeding hogs so the Silvopasture for livestock production is by far the most scalable thing, um, silvopasture or agroforestry practice. And that's what we want to be involved in and leading the, leading the practice for. Um, and then even within this, the realm of silvopasture, we approach things differently. So I think most silvopasture has been approached by foresters. And a forester comes to an open piece of land and they just dream about how many trees they could plant and they could grow for timber, right? Because that's what a forester's mindset is. Whereas for our clients, our clients are grazers, right? They look at a forest and they, they get scared because they've lost all their forages. And timber is typically not in the, it's not a main concern for our clients. Um, planting trees so that you can get a timber harvest in 50 years is not a primary thing that we're going after. Our primary thing is supporting the grazing operation and supporting their livestock as is through shade, through feed. And we do integrate timber trees 
on a fairly small scale, but it's more of a tertiary thing that we're looking for as a means of bringing ecological diversity and also income diversity way down the road. But those first thing that those trees are serving, the first purpose that those have on that farm is to benefit the livestock and the ecosystem on that farm. And then timber is a, a long-term thing that has it's kind of a, a cherry on top in our systems. And that's probably because I'm not a I'm not a forester. We don't have foresters on our team. I'm I'm sure that there will be systems um, where timber should be more of a, a primary or secondary concern. But for our area, with our clients, it is not. So that sets us apart a little bit from the rest of the agroforestry and silvopasture crowd, <laughs> a small crowd. <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. This has been an awesome conversation, and uh, I'm sure you've you have so many different types of experiences, even in the these very early days. What is a question that I've missed asking? What's an important topic that we should talk about? One thing that I want to make sure that I communicate to people is that I really highly recommend starting small on silvopasture. What I don't want to see is people moving forward too fast, getting too excited about um, silvopasture and moving ahead and then getting getting discouraged about failures, about trees dying, trees not, not taking off um, the way that they anticipate. I should reiterate, we're in a very, very early phase of this what I'll call a movement of silvopasture, a, a learning how to, a relearning how to use this practice because silvopasture is a really, really old practice, but we've lost how to use it and how to integrate it and specifically how to integrate it into a 21st century grazing system. So what I tell people is start small, start with just planting 10 trees, see how those work on your farm, see how you can protect those, um, what works, what does not, how your livestock interact with them, how your trees interact with the soils. Do that on a scale of 10 trees and use those trees that are cheap and inexpensive and like and that respond well, even if they're abused. Do that on a small scale. And then over time, build in those more expensive trees once you have the knowledge and the confidence that you can indeed protect those trees. When we do a project, if a farmer say wants to do a thousand trees, we won't do all those thousand trees on their farm all at once. Typically what we look to do is we'll say, let's start with 10 trees right now so that you get some hands-on experience between now and our first real planting date. And then maybe we'll do 10 or 20% of those trees. And then we'll wait a year or two before we do our next phase so that we have the real time to sit back and reflect what worked, what did not work. How are my livestock interacting with these trees? There's a whole bunch of benefits too of, of starting early and you can grow your own genetic stock that's adapted to your site that can reduce your costs. You can reuse tree shelters. There's most likely going to be better funding available in the future. There's gonna be better tree stock available in the future. There's going to be better support systems uh, available in the future. So I don't want the silvopasture to be a fad. I absolutely don't want it to be a fad. I think there's a really strong, really strong value that silvopasture can bring. And I want people to have a good experience with it right out of the gate. Um, and the best way to do that is to start small, be conservative, and have a long-term view that we are going to work at this slow and steady over the course of a long time. And that is a recipe for success. That is kind of the nature of trees is slow and steady for a long period of time. And I suspect that many of the listeners to this podcast are probably not the personality tripes that are particularly inclined to starting slow, but I guess we'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> That's why I give the caution. We have plenty of people who come to us and they say, I just bought my land. I want to plant 100 acres of silvopasture. And we say, slow down, slow down. <laughs> yeah. Austin, thank you tremendously 
for sharing all of the things that you have learned for your wisdom and your insights. And I'm really excited to see how this grows for you and how this develops. I mean, there is, it's, uh, it's starting scaling small. Actually, tell us a little bit about um, how you expect to see this scale. I believe that you're starting to branch out and not just be locally focused anymore, but working on other uh, larger scale projects. How, how, is, how do you see that evolving? Yeah, a couple of different things. So for the last number of years, our focus really has been our small corner of Pennsylvania with most of our projects happening within an hour of, of our office. We now have the size of, of staff um, that we can start to look outside of that area as well. Um, we want to do so again, slow and steady and strategically. One of the things that we're going to be looking for in the next couple of years is more opportunities to go down south. So for us, that means Virginia, North Carolina, to do projects, ideally a couple larger projects so that we have winter work for our crew. So we can go down and know that we are, the weather is going to be work uh, so that we can put plantings in in January and February. That's kind of a first thing for us. And then mulberries is one of the trees that we're going to be rolling out in the next couple of years kind of the earliest tree of really high high quality tree with the right genetics the right kind of stock that we can roll out here uh, kind of as the first really high quality tree so we're looking for more hog silvopasture systems to work with in the coming years and then probably what it'll look like is starting hubs at different places throughout the country. We're just at the very early phases of looking at that and we're going to need to add more organizational capacity before we do that. But that is what we're starting to work towards is being able to serve other areas of the country and not just be limited to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So that's in the works. Uh, and details will be will roll out in the next number of years. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Austin. To all of our listeners, it's Austin Unruh, Trees for Grazers. You can find them online. We'll also link in the show notes. And uh, Austin, thank you for being here. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to more discussions with you going forward. Thank you very much, John. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening and we look forward to working with you.